Well, good morning to those of you who've made it on this uh, football Saturday. It's an exciting day in Columbus with uh, Ohio State and Wisconsin. Um, we do want to say thank you for joining us on behalf of the Ohio Psychological Association staff and the elected presidents and the board of directors. This is the annual fall assembly. This assembly came to us uh, sort of as an inception and Catherine, uh, please feel welcome to contribute too if, if I'm misspeaking. Um, starting in spring of 2014 uh, with a task force that OPA initiated towards a uh, revision of our overall association governance. And in doing so, um, in the governance model and transformation, uh, we made a much smaller, more nimble board, uh, which has an 11 member board of directors, uh, leadership teams that are under those respective uh, board of director vice presidents, and then the various uh, groups within them. This assembly happens twice a year. This is the virtual assembly that occurs in the fall. And then during the annual convention in the spring, there is two days of in-person assembly. Uh, the assembly is a forum for us to uh, highlight a topic of interest, as well as to solicit feedback from our membership uh, to inform all levels of the OPA leadership team how we can further support our membership and psychology in Ohio. Uh, today's topic is another reflection of that commitment to our membership and servicing a topical area of, of interest. Um, before I turn over to Cindy, Catherine, uh, since I know you have intimate uh, involvement with the, uh, the governance changes, did I say anything that maybe you can improve upon? No, that, that sounds great, Eric. I, I think, um, you know, this has become one of our richer discussions uh, that we've had in OPA. You know, when we go to convention, it's more presentation and the assembly is uh, just brief overview of background information and then really discussion uh, for leaders and members. So it ends up being a really nice way for us to talk in depth about issues of relevance to psychologists and also the public in Ohio. Hey. And being able to do this both through the virtual forum in the fall and then the two days of uh, starting our in-person assemblies in the spring really has just developed some very rich dialogue and just been a, a really positive experience to be attached to. And so at this point, uh, one of the multitudes of responsibilities of the president-elect is to organize and facilitate the fall virtual assembly as well as the forthcoming spring. So I would like to welcome Dr. Cindy Van Curen as the OPA president-elect and as the facilitator and moderator of today's assembly. So Cindy, if I may uh, hand over the microphone, so to speak to you. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm getting some emails from our uh, content exer expert, Tracy Dwydock. She's having a little trouble with the, the Zoom link. So uh, I'm gonna keep checking my phone to make sure that she's able to join us soon. Uh, in the meantime, Dr. Dwyduck was very kind in preparing a very comprehensive eight page document that provides a lot of statistics, a lot of background, uh, cultural information, risk factors and so forth um, that we will distribute to all of the registrants later. For the purposes of the discussion, we've broken it down to just a, a page and a half so that we can kind of narrow our focus to information that's more, uh, well, not, not as broad. I mean, that's a lot to cover in a shorter period of time. But we really want this to be discussion-based. I'm just going to give a, a quick background on the information. Uh, Michael has kindly agreed to do a screen share for this background part. And then we're going to launch into our discussion. So what uh, Dr. Dwyak has prepared for us are just some facts about suicide in the USA. Uh, the rate being highest in middle-aged white men in particular. And white males accounted for 69.67% of the suicide deaths in 2017. In, uh, so in the National Survey of Drug Use and Mental Health, it gives some breakdowns by age. Uh, again, the, the highest rate being among adults ages 45 and, 50, and 54, and then again, those over age 85. 
Uh, adult females are more likely to attempt and black students are more likely to attempt than is true for white students. And I've noticed a lot of media attention recently on these higher um, rates of suicide and suicide attempts in the African-American com community. So perhaps we can uh, incorporate some of that in our discussion. Uh, firearms being the most common, followed by suffocation to include hanging and then poisoning. Um, sorry, I'm still just checking for Tracy. And yet, Tracy? Okay. All right, in 25 or 2015, the suicide rate for males was four times the rate for females. So as we mentioned earlier, the attempt rate is higher for women, but the lethality tends to be higher among the man, men. Um, in Ohio, the suicide is the second leading cause of death in youth and young adults ages 10 to 24. Um, 187 young people die by suicide every year in Ohio, which I find very alarming. And, uh, and I'd be curious maybe in the discussion to talk about, thank you, Eric, uh, to talk about the impact maybe of social media on that, that trend among young folks. Uh, Tracy did remind us of some of the risk factors being prior suicide attempt, misuse and abuse of alcohol and drugs, knowing someone who died by suicide, chronic disease and disability. And that's one that uh, is close to my heart in terms of the chronic pain being a very high risk factor for our folks. Lack of access to behavioral care, which uh, again, we will discuss in terms of cultural disparities there. And then some of the warning signs that we should be routinely assessing for uh, poor performance at work or school, giving things away, being more withdrawn, uh, if they make a sudden change to their look and making jokes about killing themselves, um, feeling trapped, changes in sleeping patterns, mood swings, um, and a sudden increase in positive mood. So, and I, I've heard that before and hopefully Tracy can elaborate that when folks have sort of made their peace with that decision, then we might actually see an improvement in their mood before they actually attempt suicide. So I'm going to go ahead, um, I want to open the floor for discussion, and again, I apologize, I'm going to be distracted because I really want Tracy to be able to join us. Any, are you on yet, Tracy? Okay. All right. You got but, me on the phone. We got you on the phone. Okay. Did you get that link I just resent, or is it not working? I got the link, and I'm working on it right now. Awesome. Oh, there we go. Okay, so Tracy, what you've um, missed is basically just an introduction from Eric and myself. Um, I've let the, the registrants know that we're going to distribute the uh, very comprehensive eight-page document that you sent out, so they have that background. But in terms of discussion, we just kept it a little bit more focused. And uh, this is just a chance for everybody to um, facilitate a meaningful or to have a meaningful discussion around this really uh, significant and seemingly growing issue that affects our patients and our colleagues. Uh, so with that, I, I wanted to kind of talk about some of the cultural risks um, in suicide or cultural factors in suicide risk and prevention. What are some of the things that we know or that we should be attending to in terms of managing these? This is Catherine. Um, so I work in a university setting at Cleveland State University and our populations that are at higher risk are the LGBT population and also veterans. Um, so those are two groups that are really impacted more uh, by suicide risk. And I'll build on Catherine. This is Eric. I am the Central Office Psychologist for Akron Public Schools, a large urban school district. And so our students are at risk because of the really a multitude of effects, but poverty and trauma within their neighborhoods uh, contribute. We also have terrific problems, unfortunately, with gang violence. Um, and then intergenerational issues uh, related to not just trauma, but also um, lack of access to resources and supports. Absolutely. 
So in terms of some of these higher risk groups, what efforts are already in place or what efforts should we have? Hi there. Hi, Tracy. Uh, welcome. Uh, Tracy, might, do, are you still on the phone as well? We're getting an echo. How's that? that? Getting out of there. More echoey. There we go. There we go. All right. So, uh, so some of the points that were just came up are the higher risk folks of LGBT in universities, uh, poverty, traumas, gang violence being issues in um, school system. So, what are some of the systems that are already in place to address these at risk populations, or, or what what's available to these folks who may not um, be seeking mental health treatment in the first place? Gosh, I think it might be different across different contexts. Um, like for LGBT folks, there are national prevention efforts. Uh, there's a Trevor hotline, which is a specific LGBT um, suicide prevention hotline. Uh, the veterans also have their own specific hotline. So uh, those groups might feel particularly like uh, they do better talking with folks who understand their background or their culture or their identity. Mm -hmm. um, so having really specific um, hotlines and outreach efforts to those groups is something that uh, occurs nationally and then I think in different locations. So at Cleveland State University, we have a veterans center. We also have an LGBT center. Um, and they work closely with the counseling center to provide uh, mental health access and, and prevention and workshops uh, to help shore up resources. And also um, I think sense of belonging and connection are some of the main protective factors mm -hmm. for suicide. Uh, so where we are able to uh, re kind of buffer the effects of stigma um, and discrimination by having good community, a uh, good sense of community uh, acceptance within that community um, that's helpful. Uh, so I think on university campuses, it probably varies across campuses. Uh, same thing with the schools. Maybe uh, we know schools, uh, this is your area, Eric, but uh, K through 12 schools that have like a gay straight alliance have fewer uh, deaths mm -hmm. by suicide or less suicide risk for LGBT folks. Um, so I think those communities of belonging make a big difference to buffer that. That's really useful because I'm just thinking back to my undergrad days in a small, rural, tiny little college where things like this just were never discussed and so forth. Um, and so I'm just kind of wondering, had that university um, been more sensitive, had some of these things in place, I just wonder what the rest of the community would have done in response. And so I wonder if there's still that pressure or stigma or if there's still a division among folks who do wish to participate in these organizations uh, and, you know, the folks who are less aware or, or resistant or whatever the word might be. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear from folks on the line who are more in the private practice realm, um, you know, how that works in, in those areas too. Uh, I think you know, one of the things we see for our clients is if their parents are really accepting of their LGBT identity, they don't have as much risk. But for those who've been kicked out of their house or rejected by parents because of their identities, their suicide risk is much higher. And I think that's true with any group of individuals, whether it's someone with a serious and persistent mental illness, if someone has a drug use issue, um, if you're you know, in the classroom and you're not a part of the cool kids club and you're feeling, you know, disenfranchised. I think it, regardless of kind of what your, what your, you know, where you are, what your social situation is, I think there's dis that disconnectedness is number one, one of the number one risk factors uh, for, for suicide. Yeah, Katie, you were, what's the um, setting you work in? I know Virginia and, and Ken are in private practice. 
Um, so I work uh, doing pediatric integrated behavioral health with Cleveland Clinic. That's right. um, so I'm at one of their, their family health centers. Um, so in, in that kind of setting. So um, while because of the fact that I'm tending to do brief treatment, um, I don't always work with a ton of kids who have really high level concerns. It is something, of course, that is coming through our office all the time or kids that I'm working with are bringing up um, things about suicidal ideation or engaging in um, non-suicidal self-injury and, and is something that, that we are um, always on the lookout. And um, as an organization working to better our policies to identify kids early in that process um, and then also make sure we're getting them connected and getting the services and keeping them safe once they are, like, if they are experiencing suicidal ideation. Hi, uh, this is Virginia. <clears throat> um, I've just um, personally had a couple cases where um, someone was trans and, but had not come out to their family. And um, in one case, uh, when they came out to their family, they got kicked out and then stopped therapy because their parents were paying for the therapy. So I honestly don't know the outcome in that case. Yeah, and that gets tricky, too, of, like, you know, we definitely, there are definitely kids that I work with who have come out to me and have not come out to their family and helping them think through that process of what they're going to do um, and knowing that, yeah, if they they disappear, hopefully making sure that they have my contact information so we can mm -hmm. hopefully at least get them some care coordination and things like that um, and get them some services somewhere even if they're like, yeah, I can't still come to you or find ways that I might be able to work with my organization to, if that happened, it has not happened yet. What are those next steps we can take to help keep that kid safe and connected to resources and not just out totally on their own? Yeah. And I, I think I did make a phone call. Um, I think I, I just want to make sure that they were okay. Um, and they were, you know, essentially sleeping on people's couches, um, but continuing to go to class at a university, and um, I think I had suggested going there for treatment, mm -hmm. you know, so um, I don't, but mm -hmm. I, you know, like I said, I don't know the outcome. But. And that continuity of, of care is a tricky part. It's particularly in the schools where oftentimes our efforts are targeted more at the primary prevention or acute assessment. And then if there is an acute level of suicidal ideation or suicidal behavior in, that a student is showing, then we get to a place we refer the student for uh, psychiatric evaluation. A uh, student may or may not receive inpatient admission or treatment, and then the student is back at school. And then having a, a follow-up uh, course of action, safety planning, and then um, continuing to try to try to advance the students uh, overall comprehensive supports can be particularly challenging on the school side of the equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I it think sounds like a variety of settings, but I think it speaks to the importance of you know, screening for suicide risk and then assessing more thoroughly a person's risk so that we can continue to monitor that throughout the course of our contact with that individual. And I was struck just in the community I reside in, which is Stowe outside of Akron. Uh, one of our recent graduating seniors uh, this past year, uh, his parents had, uh, he was a, a, a student who identified as gay, who his parents sent him to a conversion therapy camp this summer. Mm -hmm. And um, he uh, died by suicide uh, within the past week, um, unfortunately. And so I think it is a poignant reminder of just our are also our efforts on um, conversion and, and reparative therapies. Yeah, I, I think these like minority populations, whether it's LGBT or ethnic minority or uh, low income, the access to resources and then the discrimination and lack of belonging create this 
a vicious uh, trio of problems that makes it hard for them to be completely safe and stay safe. Um, I feel like those three things really, really make a difference. If, if you're couch surfing, you've been kicked out by your family, and then you're experiencing any kind of microaggressions or not feeling belonging, and then and it's hard to access care because you were using your parents' insurance, um, it makes it really hard for us as, as providers to make sure that person's okay and have that continuity and safety that we would want for our students and our, our clients. And back to your question earlier, Catherine, I do wonder if that's more difficult in a private practice setting versus, you know, a medical setting like where I am or the university where you can kind of just sort of pick up the phone call and, and make a connection. Um, what do folks in private practice do to extend that support network or, or what's available to you? Well, this is Howard. Um, I mean, certainly we had those suicide prevention and net net care here in Columbus that we could refer folks to. I mean, it, it, when I had clients who were suicidal, I, I always gave my cell phone number and made myself as readily available as I could be. Um, you know, the, the theme for me that, that led to suicide was just this feeling of being hopeless and helpless, along with all the other things that you're mentioning. That, that when somebody feels like there's just no options, um, that, that that's what makes it very difficult. I mean, earlier on in the, in the AIDS crisis, uh, when somebody was diagnosed with HIV, and this is probably true with a lot of chronic illnesses, is that if somebody feels like there's a little hope for them, um, that makes it really, really difficult for them. Self-loathing is, is a huge factor too. Um, if anybody's done the, the CAMS, the Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality, um, that's created by David Jobes, he actually looks at all the, the drivers of, of, that might drive someone to, to kill themselves by suicide. And that if you're, if you're feeling suicidal related to feelings that you have about yourself versus you're, you wanna kill yourself because of the feelings that you have related to other people, I mean, if it's about yourself, you're at much higher risk. So mm -hmm. I think, unfortunately, at a lot of the populations that we're talking about, because of the lack of acceptance or access to services, um, I think, unfortunately, a lot of them fit that fit the bill of, you know, having having some issues about how they feel about themselves. So mm -hmm. jacks up their risk big time. I'm uh, I'm doing a little bit more um, caring for my mom as she's aging, and really, you know, seeing her struggle with uh, self worth when she can't be productive and when she doesn't feel like she's contributing to her community or helping other people enough. Um, so I'm wondering if that might be one of the things uh, with older folks when, you know, I used to think, oh, it's just that like they have a terminal illness or. Um, they're lonely, but uh, that self-worth piece around, you know, if they've lived their whole lives working really hard and, you know, feeling productive and like they're worth something because of everything they're doing, um, that's a huge loss uh, for identity. And I think that, you know, that sense of uh, she starts to feel like a burden, that's a puts her at higher risk. Like loss of identity, loss of purpose, mm -hmm. probably loss of functioning, loss of support systems, feeling hopeless about or helpless to change. I mean, just, tick, 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 tick. Mm -hmm. you know, the risk, you can see why older individuals are at such high risk. Yeah. And I, I also see that in the VA system for folks who are medically discharged from the military. So they were there that was going to be their career and they got injured to an extent that couldn't they couldn't continue uh and then they there was no plan b and they were feeling pretty much without a foundation or a plan and it's it's a it's very very hard to help them figure out how to meet their own personal value system when their direction was um greatly altered i also I think sometimes we have to remember the intersectionality of the organic or biologic or medical correspondence to those issues, uh, whether we're dealing with people that have terminal illnesses, fragility, or, or, um, or chronic conditions, where many of those conditions exacerbate inflammation processes to contribute to psychopathology presentations or 
honestly, even the treatment and the medications bringing forth a whole spate of, of unattended iatrogenic side effects that also produce the, the least some of the depressive affect and, and so forth. Yeah, as you were talking, Cindy, I was thinking of a client with traumatic brain injury mm -hmm. from military service and the mm -hmm. resulting depression, you know, could be very biological in addition mm -hmm. to, you know, the potential to lose her military career. Absolutely. I even think of even younger people. I, when I did the Zero Suicide Academy, the first time one of the presenters was a mom who had lost her uh, college age son to suicide. And he was a big basketball star, uh, had a, a major injury where he could no longer play. And, you know, for him, that was, that was his identity. That was his goal. That was his plan. And yeah, that, that was enough for him to, to decide that life was no longer worth living. So, so circling back to some of the cultural factors that we've already talked about and some of the uh, risk factors, um, what about discrimination? What role does that play in terms of suicide rates, access to care, willingness to reach out to some of these other organizations? What have folks seen? A fascinating example of that, Cindy, is in the Akron metropolitan area, the North Hill uh, part of the city has experienced a just a dramatic increase of Southeast Asian uh, immigrants and refugees. And so there are both cultural determinants of how mental health and, and access to mental behavioral health care is perceived in our Southeast Asian populations. But then it's also a whole spate of logistical challenges, um, starting with who can interpret or provide therapeutic services. Um, and then there are both uh, external and internal biases, not just about accessing uh, behavioral mental health, particularly if it's from a governmental actor for many of those individuals who are escaping governmental-based depression. The idea that the government is then going to provide some sort of support is challenging. And then likewise, the perception that others within the communities have uh, of the same individuals who are experiencing those challenges. Just to add to that, I think too, <clears throat> cultural, the biases are there. I think also just when it comes to us as professionals, I mean, my, um, my dad died by suicide. So that, that, that discrimination, uh, I felt that returning to work, hmm. um, you know, mental health professionals, as, as educated as we are and as compassionate as we can be, I think still, we still struggle with how to manage uh, our coworkers, <clears throat> even grief of people that we care about. And I think when that grief is related to loss by suicide, I think, I think many of us still kind of struggle with what to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, and whether it was intentionally, you know, the behaviors were intentional or not, but I definitely felt um, kind of out there and potentially judged when I came back to work after my dad died. So just to kind of take out the, the cultural piece, but the us, them, and this is stuff that happens to us, I think too, on a, on a daily basis as well. I think that kind of, I, I wonder about how often we're getting referrals for, for things such as this for, the, uh, the program through OPA where we can actually support one another. The, give me the name, Cindy, I'm losing it here. <clears throat> Thank you for that disclosure, Tracy, and, and certainly giving us a window into the work that, that you do. And I think that also gives us a reminder too about part of our prevention levels of prevention work trying to uh, allay the stigmatization of mm -hmm. suicidality and how to uh, shift the, the 
the perceptions of suicide. This yeah, I, I find a lot when I'm talking with other uh, faculty or staff at the university that there's a sense of mental health issues being a problem or uh, talking about suicide is stigmatized uh, because suicide is seen as a problem or a bad thing. Um, and of course, it's something we want to prevent and it's, it's a harmful and painful thing. Um, but stigmatizing it or seeing it, uh, you know, seeing suicidal thoughts as a problem um, makes it hard for people to talk about those thoughts and get the help that they need. Mm -hmm. So I think that's right, Tracy, around stigma, stigma around mental health issues. And um, it's, it's tricky because we operate from a very medical model uh, where there's, there's like a disease model. Um, and it feels like sometimes within psychology, there's two extremes of the folks who are medical model and then the folks who are like, more radical or feminist or let's throw out the diagnoses <laughs> where most of us probably practice in the middle. Uh, the rhetoric sometimes falls to either side of that. Uh, makes it hard to like destigmatize without, um, you know, well, we want to st stick to our evidence-based practice and do things that work uh, and lift stigma around mental health concerns. So I think it can be a little bit difficult navigating that. Um, and it's hard to like I I self disclose among my staff that I've struggled with depression that my father died by suicide um, when I was a baby, and so they know that. Uh, but on campus, as the counseling center director, I haven't self disclosed those things as much um, because of the stigma, right? So I'm, you know, I don't want to lose influence for my staff and my center by self disclosing something that still really is quite stigmatized. Uh, in our larger society. And that's a message that, that kids and, and teens get so early too. Like I do have some kids and teenagers who are coming in to talk to me and they will, you know, tell me really openly um, about some of the thoughts that they're having about not wanting to be alive. And then some will see me for a long time and then it gets to a breaking point and they're like, yeah, so this has been happening for a long time or their parents see something and we find out that this has been happening. So despite the fact that they've been coming in and talking to me about all of these different things that were going on, there was still that piece of stigma that was holding them back from, from feeling like it was okay to share that this was happening. Um, and it is, you know, a lot of them do report that sense of relief once they finally shared it with someone and that they're able to get that support and that help. Um, and it's something to always be striving for, for creating that, that open environment where they feel even more comfortable than they already do to do that. I, th I think it's amazing too, that when we, I, I think it's important for us to be aware of what we bring to the room right. um, when we're sitting with someone who's struggling. I mean, I, I, I cringe when I think about this, but I actually have walked by an office that didn't have real great soundproofing and overheard someone ask, ask someone, you're not suicidal, are you? Mm -hmm. And something as simple as the way that we ask those questions, when do we ask them, how do we ask them, those things convey a lot to the person we're sitting across from mm -hmm. about what our comfort level is with their response and the topic in general. Um, and I think, yeah. If anybody has the opportunity to do an AMSER training, which is assessing and managing suicide risk, that's all about kind of becoming aware of kind of where your head's at, how you're feeling, what you bring to the room, um, and then working with that and increasing your comfort level with being able to identify, you know, a person's risks and, then, and protective factors and creating a risk formulation and then knowing actually what to do with that information. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of times we aren't real well trained on how to screen or assess or treat using evidence-based treatments. Mm -hmm. And so many people do kind of want to go, you're really not suicidal, are you? Because they, mm -hmm. not because they don't care, they just don't know really what to do next. And the old, you know, pink slip is not, not the treatment of choice any longer, so... 
You know, that's, and all of this is so interesting about who we are as people in the room. Obviously, we're, we're a part of the tool that we're using and the self-disclosure. Um, being embedded on a medical team, I do have a lot of patients who ask, if I've ever had their particular medical condition, either as a challenge to say, you don't know what you're talking about, lady, or um, as a connection, right? You know, can, can you understand and relate and are you living better this way? I don't know if anyone's ever asked me about my mental health. I don't know if a patient's ever said, have you ever been depressed, Dr. Van Curen? I, I'm not sure that I can speak to that. I can come up with lots of examples for the medical. So that's an interesting point in terms of who we are to them. Uh, is it that they just, is it the stigma or is it that they just think, of course, a psychologist would never have mental health problems? I, I'm not sure, um, but I'm not sure I'd ever really reflected on it before. I wonder, Howard, if you could maybe say a little bit from that, the lens of our colleague assistance program with, yes. with OPA and maybe speak a little bit to where uh, Cindy is, is describing uh, that very topic. <clears throat> Well, I think, you know, what, what one of our major focuses is just to help people to keep looking at the shame that people feel about asking for help. Mm -hmm. um, again, feeling suicidal is like one of the most shameful things that I think you can feel, this sense that, that, that there's something, like you said, the self-loathing, there's something so wrong with me. Um, and, I, and I think, unfortunately, our colleagues, I mean, I had a colleague who committed suicide um, after he left our practice. And, it, and you know, I just so many times, you know, people who commit suicide, they have they have support. They have friends. And I, I like Tracy, I had a very good friend who committed suicide actually in my house. Um, and um, he he had tons of friends. Um, and we were providing him all the support we could when he got diagnosed with, with HIV. Um, but he just felt totally out of control and, and just couldn't face what was next. And, and uh, so, I, you know, I think that, that, you know, people just don't know what to say after a suicide, much less as we're talking about. Sometimes it's hard to know how to help our clients. And so I think... Uh, as an organization, we have a responsibility to keep reaching out to our colleagues and helping them feel as safe as is possible to be able to get the help they need. I totally agree with you. I actually attended a, a workshop. Is it probably three years ago now? It was that no uh, clinician left behind that was put on by... Um, uh, by the colleague assistance program and it was very interesting to to be a part of that group because so many of those people fellow psychologists were talking about you know wanting to go across state lines to get therapy and that was actually after my dad died so i had i had like the most rigid boundaries before my dad died if you asked for self disclosure i'd be like oh no way we're not going there um but with, after he passed, I, I, I have been very vocal about, um, about his death and what he died from and about the fact that, yes, I have access therapy and, and all of those things. And I, I've, I've seen it much more of a way to connect um, with patients than I have as a distancing factor. So I guess I'm, I feel like I just want to scream at everybody. It's like, dudes, it's not that bad. Come on. Just, just do it. We're people first, clinicians second. Come on. And we recommend this to our patients if you'd be willing to do it. Um, but, but that takes me over to Ken Drew. I, I'm wondering, uh, in, in terms of uh, your work with SciPact, are you seeing that? Are you seeing that that's part of the push is providers would feel more comfortable getting virtual services across state lines, not, not kind of having to stay in their own professional community. Well, I, I think uh, SIPAC would certainly provide an opportunity for greater access for, for services. So that, that would be something that could be done much more easily than it is now. We unfortunately are 
are shackled with uh, antiquated uh, licensing laws uh, that restrict that kind of practice uh, without taking some risk for your license. So uh, I think it really is really critical for SIPAC uh, to be something that's adopted by all the states, as many as possible, so that it, there's greater flexibility in what people can do uh, in providing services. So even though you may be providing services in your state, um, there may people move around, mm -hmm. psychologists move around. And so we need to have practice, pra be able to be, be able to practice wherever we are, or wherever mm -hmm. our client is. That's the bottom line. And in order mm -hmm. to do that, we need to deal with these changes the laws that are restricting us from being able to do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, I agree. And I, and I do wonder, would that, would that be helpful in making this, um, more accessible, more approachable with people. If people didn't feel like they were locked into their <clears throat> professional community and then, you know, they're going to a therapist and they run into them at a cocktail party. I mean, would that make a difference if we could access folks outside our professional community? I don't know. But I think that's a really important point that you brought up, Tracy. And, and of course, yes, we, I, I always tell my patients, I will not ask you to do anything that I will not personally do myself. And so that should include therapy. Yeah, I'd like to think we all thought that way, but I'll tell you, it was, it was challenging. It was interesting coming back to work because there was this huge us them kind of thing where I came back with new lenses and came back and heard people talking about, well, those people and they this. And oh, I remember having, um, having gone to a workshop on trauma <clears throat> and I have a, memory lapse in terms of the clinician's name, but he was awesome. He was talking about really the only thing that, that differentiates us from the people that we're sitting across is the time of day that we get our services. Hmm. So. I want to shift to onto agree. the, oh, please go ahead. I agree that, that when professionals are able to um, be human and be vulnerable, with whomever it is, um, including their own therapist and with their own colleagues, it, we're just able to be so much more effective in our work and, of course, healthy ourselves. Um, it's just difficult to, a lot of times, take that risk because it just feels so scary and there are all those ethical laws about, oh, my God, I have to be, you know, you know, it's this perception somehow we have to be perfect or nearly perfect in order to do, do our jobs. And if we're struggling, that's, you know, that, then we're not confident. And, you know, I mean, it, people just need some, need a lot more compassion in order to self-compassion and compassion from, e from each other. Great. Yeah, one, one of the things I think about is workplace culture. Um, you know, if you're in a workplace where you are the professional and you have to be invulnerable and have it all together all the time, uh, even with colleagues, that's probably not going to be very protective. Um, and uh, we recently, it was a, maybe a month or so ago, a uh, counseling center director who was very competent and well loved uh, died by suicide. Uh, so afterwards, the articles, you know, talked about uh, who's taking care of the caregivers. And I was just at the director's conference uh, last weekend in San Antonio. And uh, it was interesting uh, because, you know, people acknowledge the kind of loneliness when you're in a leadership position. Uh, so I check on my staff and they check on each other. But who checks on me uh, mm -hmm. is the kind of question when you're in a leadership position and you're having to make tough decisions. Uh, you're not necessarily always going to choose to be vulnerable uh, with your staff. So it was a real sense of, um, you know, how do we take care of each other and how do we have folks that are checking on us, even if we're in that leadership position where we may not be vulnerable all the time uh, with our staff, we have to have someone that we can be vulnerable with and share our challenges and, you know, let them know when we're getting to the point of overwhelm. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody can be a rock all the time. So mm -hmm. I like that idea of, you know, colleague support and professional culture support for having uh, clear, direct communication about our own well-being uh, with the people we can talk to about that, uh, whether they're also leaders at our level or, 
in another state uh, instead of in our own circles. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, none of us can do enough self-care to, to keep the ship afloat if things are overwhelming. And as we're yeah, thinking, think about, go ahead, go ahead, Howard. And and I think over and over again, you know, when when the topic of self care is brought up, a lot of times I've heard colleagues say, "Well, I just don't have time for that," <laughs> you know, and and it's like that really is concerning that mm -hmm. you know we can't even like take five minutes, you know, take it doesn't have to be. I mean, people sometimes they go at me that I have to spend lots of money, I have to go to the spa, or I have to, you know, mm -hmm. take expensive vacations. And there are lots of really simple ways to care for ourselves. A really good that, reminder. Isn't that the stuff that we're asking our clients to do as well? <laughs> Just thinking that, like, yeah. Isn't that what's that about saying? Absolutely. You know, that, we don't have any problem do it, advocating for that. <laughs> those, those who can't do teach was it? One of those, one of those things. Oh, man. So what are some of the things that we can do to, um, you know, help to address suicide risk among our colleagues, among our patients? What are some steps that we could start to take? I, mean, I know that, that Howard has suggested maybe even changing the name of the colleague assistance program in the hopes that it would be more welcoming. I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Howard. Well, we have we presented this to call it the prevention and wellness program. Um, the board still has to vote on that, but we're hopeful that they will agree to that. Because again, we're just and that actually came at the suggestion of Ron Ross, who's the executive director of the psychology board, because he felt like calling it colleague systems was too stigmatizing. So, and and we agreed when we thought about it. Um, and it just, it seems like whatever we can do to just keep promoting wellness. I mean, I think in terms of just what we can do, I mean, we have to ask the questions. It's like when people have any kind of trauma, you have to ask about it. If you don't ask most people because it's shameful, they're not going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be, become something that we give people permission to talk about. I think that's a huge piece of it. And that, it's, that we can handle it, it's really okay, and we're there for them. Well, I think with that too, it goes like making that just a normal part of what you were checking in with people about, um, with patients, with friends, of like just how they're doing, especially with, with, with patients too, like during an appointment, um, having that be something that is part of your normal, this is what I'm checking in about. It is okay to ask me about it's not, and it's okay to talk about, and it's not necessarily something that I'm waiting until, oh, I think you're in a real bad place today. I should ask you this. But it's something that's coming up even before that so people have that opportunity to talk about, and it's normalized way before it might even happen for them. And that, I think, sets a tone for people, too. You know, just, well, you, set, you ask about it each time. Clearly, you're comfortable with it. Clearly, clearly you know it's it's a potential for me. Okay, when I when I'm ready or I need to, I'm gonna feel more comfortable talking with you about it versus someone who hasn't brought it up once. Mm -hmm. Right, and they know going in, oh, this is gonna be a question that comes up today. Maybe today will be the day that I'm ready to to open up about this. And I do like the idea of reassuring the patients we're we're ready. So we're we're here to help with that. We we can listen to it. We can handle it. We don't need to to um, we don't need to add to the discomfort of the situation. And so by normalizing it and making it a routine part of the check-in, that makes a lot of sense. I was always told first five minutes you ask. If you leave it till the last five, and then you get a. Oh yes, by the way, I am suicidal. Now you're cursing under your breath because now you don't have enough time to address and do everything you need to do to, to manage that, that particular situation. True, and working with parents too, I always try to encourage them to check in with me or call me and tell me beforehand because um, I've had the experience a few times if I go out at the very end to get the parent to be able to check back in and then they're like, oh, did they bring this up to you? And I'm like, we have three minutes left now. 
Um, <laughs> so really trying to set up that environment too, where parents can feel comfortable coming in and telling me that as well, whether it's just at that beginning of the appointment or calling beforehand of like, hey, my kid mentioned this, I'm really concerned about it. And that's yeah. a struggle we have in the school setting, a lot of engaging a lot of our parents. Uh, someone responsible for overseeing our suicide risk assessment and intervention processes one of the struggles we have every single day is engaging our parents when a student is in crisis. It is horrific to say this out loud, but we, we are constantly told by parents, I don't have time for that. Um, I'm at work. I can't get to wherever you are telling me to go to. Um, I've even had parents just flat out say to me in a, on a regular basis, I'm done with this. You know, I, even to the point they can just die. I don't need to be bothered. And, um, that then creates a whole nother layer of challenges from whether or not we need to take temporary custody of a student in a juvenile rule six, uh, trying to transact CSB involvement, but, um, and that's a, just a whole nother layer of complication that we deal with is, is trying to engage families into a process when a child is in crisis. Yeah, that, that kind of um, <clears throat> makes me think about like caregiver burnout, uh, you know, for parents and families and, and friends of people with uh, either, you know, severe concerns or um, personality um, issues. It, it can really be taxing and difficult and require a lot of skill uh, to keep caring for someone and being close to someone um, who's struggling. So I don't know if we attend enough to that. Um, so like we have groups at our center, we have a group that's based on DBT uh, for students with uh, either severe issues or, or um, uh, attachment concerns. And, you know, we're working with them, but even while we're working with them to improve their skillfulness, uh, they burn out their relationships or their friendships and they don't have social support. and. Um, and then, you know, we're left holding the bag, like you're saying, Eric, as sort of as the only ones who haven't been burned out on our care of them yet. Um, so that that's a challenge, I think, for our communities to help educate the surrounding folks to know how to keep caring and be skillful and not get frustrated. Well, and while also recognizing some of those those issues that can make it super difficult. Um, so my training is also like my 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 doctoral program is a school psychology program. Um, so working in the, the schools in, in New Orleans, where there, a lot of the families that we were working with did not have a lot of resources. And to get any, the public transportation system in New Orleans is not fabulous. <laughs> um, so if you did not have access to a car, trying to get somewhere could take you hours. And then if you had if you were working an hourly job that has no protections and can fire you in an instance, and some of those parents like that was making it really difficult. And yes, of course, for a crisis situation, that's a, a different kind of thing. But even just for steps before that, of there were teachers sometimes at my schools who would be like, why can't this mom get out here for a meeting? And I'm like, well, it would take her, you know, an hour and a half to get here if we look at kind of where she lives and her her job is working this way and we've been trying you've been pulling her and telling her she needs to come week after week after week and it's gotten to a point where she's gonna lose her job and she hasn't mentioned that to you guys but she has told that to me she's gonna lose her job if she has to keep coming so trying to to find those ways of how can we find that balance of we need to be supporting this kid we need to be supporting this family and also looking at the realities of the situation that can um, inhibit it and make it difficult and contribute to that caregiver burnout um, where they're like, well, if I don't have a job, then I'm not going to be able to provide a roof over this kid's head. And then what are we going to do? So those factors can also really contribute so much. Absolutely. One of the things I'd love to see more of um, we're doing it on a lot of college campuses is uh, suicide prevention training. Um, so this year we're doing a lot of uh, a one hour training called question, persuade, refer. Uh, we got a grant. It was the one that was most evidence-based. So this is the one we went with, but it was pretty expensive. 
Um, and so we've got a lot of students, faculty and staff who are gonna get trained on how to sit and listen to someone who's in distress and then directly ask them if they're thinking about suicide, um, which I hope will start to break down some of that stigma and help people understand this is a normal symptom to have or a normal thing to be thinking when you're overwhelmed. Um, so I, I can see us using this on university campuses and college campuses. Um, I'm not sure how much it's spreading though in our general communities, a kind of like mental health first aid or, you know, mental health version of kind of CPR where everyone gets the training and knows how to help someone who's having a mental health crisis. That's something I would love to see, you know, over the next 10 years, our society kind of change and get more of that uh, widespread. I love that idea, Catherine. And I think that's been one of the uh, best um, additions at the VA is peer support. So we have a lot of peers who have been very well trained and get supervision and they're present for anything we want them to be present for. So they are, they can be part of groups. They could, they facilitate their own groups. They could be part of outreach. Uh, I've had peers that join the patient to come talk to me for an appointment because they've been afraid to bring something up. Um, and now they're, they've been trained to go up onto the medical units as well. So it's not just the, the mental health, but adding this more relatable piece, I, I just think it's made such a difference in, um, in, de in destigmatizing. If folks can say, you can talk to her, it, it, she's okay, it, it just makes a difference. In Stark County, I've, I've been attending the um, Suicide Prevention Coalition, um, which has been just a wonderful way to connect with people and to stay uh, up to date on what is being provided in terms of trainings and things like that. And Stark County got several people trained in QPR. Um, and Catherine, like you're talking about wanting that to be much more of a widespread thing because that's a gatekeeper training. So in, in September, we made it a goal of, of doing as many of those, which suicide prevention or awareness month. So we made a goal of doing as many of those uh, gatekeeper trainings as possible. So each one of us who was trained as a, a QPR instructor went out and did as many QPR trainings as we could possibly schedule uh, because each time you you do that training you are training other people to go out and be the eyes and ears and to be able to to kind of be aware know what the risk factors are know what the warning signs are ask the questions and get people into services so you know we can't be everywhere but we can definitely give people the information that they need in order to be able to make those assessments themselves and then take action as needed so I, I think those kinds of trainings are essential. In fact, this, uh, this past August, we had our first cohort go to uh, train the trainers of mental health first aid for my school district, which was just fantastic to have a, a group of about a dozen individuals actually go for that type of training, which is really, I, I think now speaks to the initiatives we have with social emotional learning in the schools as well as um, some proposed legislation to train everyone in suicide prevention methodologies. So really very exciting. So I agree with you both, Catherine and Tracy. That's one thing that I would love to see change when it comes to OPA's influences. You know, so, so often, um, I mean, the old school way of looking at suicide prevention has historically been that as clinicians, we're kind of like these solo heroes trying to save the life of the person in front of us. And um, I don't know how many of you have been connected at all with the Zero Suicide Initiative, but that initiative is, is about kind of working to change systems. Um, and the belief is that suicides are preventable uh, for those people who are connected to health and behavioral health professionals. Um, and the belief there is that everyone plays a role in suicide prevention. So it's not just the clinician, um, it's the person at the front desk, it's the custodian, it's the, uh, the lunch lady, it's the, you know, it's everybody's responsibility. And I think that to me has been one of the, the nicest kind of progressions in, in our field. Um, I think unfortunately still as clinicians, I mean, yeah, I, I got some great training coming out of graduate school, but I'll tell you, I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and it wasn't until after my dad passed that I just dug into this suicide stuff. And I thought I was doing a decent 
assessment and providing great treatment. But, you know, when I look back, I just kind of go, oh, um, so I think kind of having the tools to be able to do the work um, alongside others, I think there's, I'd, I'd love to see some type of kind of minimum standard, you know, uh, of, of education, of, of training in the non-going CEUs uh, as a requirement for licensure. I know there are some states that are doing it for other professions, but, you know, we don't always get the things that we need, especially when, you know, things are changing and we're, we're becoming more evidence-based and we're doing, a lot of us are doing this work and, and may not necessarily have all the tools that we need to, to be as effective or as comfortable in doing it. And in some states are including that as part of their CEU requirement. So I'm also licensed in Pennsylvania and that is part of what I need to, to have is evidence that I've done um, CEUs related to um, suicidality. Um, so that is something that can be brought into um, what we require of people and has been successful in other states for psychologists. Wonderful. So Katie and Tracy, I just want to make sure I understand. So, so are you picturing sort of like, you know, we have the specific uh, ethics requirements within our greater requirement. You're picturing something uh, related to um, suicidality, suicide, suicide training as a requirement. That's how I looked at it. Mm -hmm. And that would be a board requirement rather than an OPA requirement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, right. And I could see that being something that's really valuable because like, I mean, there, even if that is not your main target, like I said, I do, I do generally brief integrated treatment with kids. It is something that comes up. And to be a psychologist who's like, well, I don't work with people who have suicidal ideation. You need to go somewhere else. Like that, yeah. it's gonna be something that's coming up where it makes people like, oh, well, this is something not everybody's gonna work with. I'm not, I can't talk about this. And there's a difference between, hey, I really wanna get you connected with someone with a higher level of, who can give you that level of care that you need for this versus I just don't do that. <laughs> like that is not, oh, you're suicidal, this is, you, you can't come to this practice. Um, and that can really inhibit that and, you know, it really, and the more people have some training and feel more comfortable with it, knowing that, that it will help patients, I think, be able to be willing to disclose in the first place. I don't know if uh, Michael or Ken or um, others were around when the changes were made uh, to, the, to the board requirements for CEUs. I assume it used to be just ethics and then some somewhere in there multicultural got added. You know, how was that process and what did OPA do in that process? Yeah, originally it wasn't, my understanding is it wasn't. I, my, my reaction would be, be very cautious in, in mandating specific CEU because then you get a, a long list. We talk about domestic violence, we talk about uh, abuse and neglect, uh, a suicidality. Um, so you can come up with a list and that because there's only there's required 24 hours in two years, you then restrict the kind of training that people can account for for the CEU. So I would I would advocate for promoting the very thing you're talking about, but initially looking at what can you do without making it mandated. Making it available as part of the programming that OPA um, does on an annual basis, uh, having things on the website that would be available for not only just to the public, but also for psychologists. Yeah, that was pretty much the conversation when we were discussing um, changes to the law and rules relating to CE. Uh, and what was decided was to keep the number of hours the same, um, mandate four hours of ethics or multiculturalism, um, rather than listing uh, multiculturalism as a separate category. I wonder too if, um, you know, if someone did successfully move to add a specific mandated topic, 
they would need to then like increase the number of CEUs essentially to keep mm -hmm. to keep enough of them open for folks' specific needs. Um, are we are we kind of low in the number of CEUs we require compared to other states, or are we in the middle or high? Kind of low, I think we're a little bit low. That's that was my sense. Uh, I talked to someone who had like twice as many required <laughs> mm -hmm. as us or uh, something close to that from another state. Uh, yeah. Yeah, some states are up around 40 something, I think. Okay. And I know uh, we had pretty good attendance. Tracy, Eric, and I talked about suicide prevention at more systems level. We had pretty good attendance at that program. And I think folks really wanted more like, what do I do in my private practice with a suicidal client? Um, and there was another workshop on that at convention. Um, yeah, I don't know if those are pretty well attended or what, what is your sense or what do folks think if we offered more of those? Well, I know that I get a lot of questions from people at the places that I work. Um, and I work at, in a hospital setting. I work in private practice as well. So um, I think people want the information, whether or not they'd be willing to you know, take three hours out of work to do it or not is another story, I think. And I think it probably would also be setting dependent. I mean, within the VA and their initiatives on suicide, we, we do so many trainings that I could see folks just kind of being burnt out, but we're also doing VA trainings, which is not always representative of the whole world. So, uh, so I wouldn't want people to miss out on other opportunities. I just think they would just kind of be um, a little worn out or overtrained. <laughs> It might be good to do just a, a webinar that private practitioners could access, you know, so that when they do have a suicidal client, there's a resource for them to learn about risk assessment and incorporating that into their regular sessions. I think it would actually be fascinating to build on that webinar idea, Catherine, and maybe have respective webinars for certain practice cohorts. So maybe private practice folks or maybe uh, folks that are attached to schools, whether it's K-12 or it's higher ed, um, all the way to maybe considering uh, community practices. So, because each one of those practice cohorts are gonna have some slightly different needs and how they need to approach suicidal clients and patients, as well as what they need to know, um, both from a, being a responsible clinician as well as um, how to tap into the various community resources and the like that they can use to support. And I would think our rural health committee should be involved with that as well. In fact, yeah. I think that's a great idea, Cindy, especially because our, our areas of, of vacant or very small levels of practice is just amplified into the rural health setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there can be higher risk in rural settings too because of the isolation and um, um, a lot of folks in rural counties might have access to firearms. Um, so there can be higher suicide risk in those areas. And less access to behavioral health care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, from a self-care perspective, uh, I certainly support us doing more work. I mean, I think in, in all the times for me in private practice, I mean, working with suicidal clients is about the most stressful thing you can possibly do. Um, at least for me, it was. Um, so, I mean, I think that the more support we can give our colleagues, the better. That's a really good point. I think I, uh, you know, working in college counseling centers, suicide risk is something that's been pretty prominent uh, for our clients. And so, um, you know, I worked in those settings as a trainee. And so I was able to ask my supervisor, you know, how do you cope when you're working with a client and you're worried that they're going to kill themselves between one session and the next, you know, they're not, you don't need to pink slip them, but you know, you're just not really certain that they're going to be safe. Um, and so I've had, 
you know, suggestions and input from supervisors. Um, I've been able to share that with my trainees. But apart from that workplace setting where we work with a lot of suicidal clients, I've never received any training on, you know, what actually works to cope with those fears that, oh, my client could die. Um, and, you know, I really haven't seen a lot or been, it hasn't been part of any of my training uh, to understand how to cope with that. Or even, uh, I did have, a, again, a supervisor talk about how he coped after a, a client did die by suicide. Um, and what he felt and how he coped with those feelings. But that's fairly personal sharing that I never received on a more training educational level. I'll make a note about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a great topic. And that is something actually that um, at the Pennsylvania um, State Convention this, I think it was this past year, it might have been the year before that, but I think it was this past year that there was a talk about um, that that was run um, by someone who has done a lot of work with, with patients with, with suicidal ideation and has had and had a whole bunch of people be able to share their experiences and talk about what those experiences were like. Um, I unfortunately was not able to attend that one because of other responsibilities that were at that same time, but it was very well received and people really found it to be a very helpful experience. So it's something that um, there are models out there from to be able to talk to people about and see how that worked for them and what they would, what they would keep, what they might change if they did it again in the future. It's interesting. When I worked in Summit County, we tried to get a, kind of a, a casual support group together for clinicians who had lost someone to suicide. It was primarily patients. And I'll tell you, you know how many people we had come out? Like two, myself and the other co-facilitator. Um, I think there are a lot of fears and anxieties that go along with that. Um, and of course, you know, if, if things are currently in a state of litigation too, I think that just amps up the anxiety. Um, relatedly, um, if you have the opportunity to do CAMS training, which is that collaborative assessment and management of suicidality, that's David Jobes' model of uh, safer suicide care. That is, he has done a lot of research on um, why people die by suicide and he has created a, a way of doing the work where he has covered everything. Um, whether it's the, you're doing a screen, you're doing an assessment, you are coming up with a safety or stabilization plan with a person um, you're creating a plan for care collaboratively with them. And it's, it's his, his, the bent on that is people haven't heard of it. It's, it's basically how to manage somebody who is suicidal on an outpatient basis without having to hospitalize. And he said, when people are doing cams, um, to fidelity, there is, there has not been any successful malpractice litigation uh, for a clinician who's, who's followed this model. So that I think is, it, I think that helps, at least it did with me to take away some of the anxiety of treating someone in an outpatient basis without having to, you know, jump to hospitalize. So I think it's a great, great tool to have in our arsenal for seeing people outpatient who are risk, at risk for suicide. I think this is really helpful knowing that what resources are already out there, uh, what models we could adopt or, or build on. Um, this, this is, I think, it, it, for those who aren't embedded in a major hospital where you're mandated to do all these trainings, I think it's great for us to be able to kind of promote these and make sure that people know um, there are resources available to them. And Howard, you mentioned some specific interest in, in this as well. Um, you know, are there ideas for what the colleague assistance program could make available or, or, or offer to folks who are um, struggling or have lost someone and not sure where to turn? 
I'm just writing myself a note right now. I don't I don't know yet, but <laughs> I'm it certainly seems like an important priority. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, offering a workshop could be one way of doing that. Uh, and it may be that we incorporate it into a workshop that both talks about how to manage suicidal clients as well as how to manage yourself. Um, I mean, I think that that could be powerful to put it to put it together into one workshop. So it's not mm -hmm. simply a workshop about how to deal with your own discomfort and struggles, but also just how to give you more tools. Mm -hmm. Has anyone, um, I'm thinking you, Cindy, you, cause you, get, you work in the VA, have you guys adopted any type of kind of peer support uh, program at all for, for, for your staff who have been through something traumatic or experienced a loss of some type? I know at the hospital I work at, we're, we're trying to put that at something like that in place. Um, but I, I think doing so um, would enable us to kind of normalize things a little bit more and destigmatize I and agree. To, to get some help if they need it when they need it because we just kind of let them know that we kind of expect that they might need some support during those tough times. I, I agree and I've really been very discouraged with um, current leadership within psychology service about the management of that. Uh, two years ago we had a patient who committed suicide in the psychologist's office and we were very specifically told not to talk about it. Uh, it we were not to reach out to the colleague. They, sh they kind of shuttered her away in an office where she couldn't talk to anyone. Recently, we had uh, a patient commit suicide on the front lawn of the VA just a couple months ago. And uh, I'm aware just because of all the panicky texts and emails going around that one of, one of our psychologists was treating him. But again, we were specifically told we are not to discuss this. Um, efforts to talk about it, even in our own professional meetings, are shut down. It's been very uh, discouraging because I, I don't agree with that approach. Sounds like the the lawyers had took the upper hand there in yeah. determining how that got dealt with, and yep. those might be conversations that need to be had, you know, before an event. You mm -hmm. know, how do we support the staff directly impacted, even if there's a potential for them to be sued and how do we support mm -hmm. the other staff who are aware of it but not directly involved. Um, right. and, and how do we just support our colleague who witnessed this trauma where the patient shot himself in the head and uh, in her office and then she has to go back and use that office. Uh, and, and again, we were specifically told we could not do that and I, I just, that was just heartbreaking to me. Mm. Minimally thoughts should be about minimizing that person's trauma and getting them out of that office and you know okay. nothing else said you know maybe you get a lighter load on acutely suicidal patients for a period of time you know mm -hmm. i don't know well and, and for even the other providers who were at that facility it's one of our outpatient facilities um because they just got the active shooter alert and and hunkered down in their offices and had no idea what was going on but knew someone was in trouble. They heard the gunshot. So again, I, I, I just wish that we could have done something just to check on those folks. Yeah, um, Ken and, and Virginia, you have large practices, is that right? How do you manage, uh, is there anything you do? I know it's private practice, so it's a different realm, but what do you do to kind of see how your, your clinicians are doing um, if they have a lot of trauma clients or suicide risk clients or a death by suicide. You're talking to me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, Ken and Virginia, I know you guys oversee larger practices and I don't know how um, that I, I, I work in a private practice, but I pretty much uh, solo practice because I really have little contact with the other, other uh, people, practitioners are in the same practice. Um, so it's, it's really, I'm kind of on my own for most of the time. Oh gosh, yeah. Uh. And fortunately, I, I don't have that many clients that this is a big issue, uh, very few. Um, so it, it's still an issue, even if it's a few. Yeah. Oh. I, 
I know we have um, kind of a norm in our in our counseling center that uh, if I'm assessing someone's risk and I'm not sure if they should go to the hospital or not, uh, or if they are going to the hospital, I tag a colleague um, and they help uh, facilitate hospitalization or they help me assess risk and make the determination so that I'm not making that decision on my own. Mm -hmm. I'm not alone with it. It can be hard because we're all sometimes with clients, um, but we kind of do our best to help each other out with that. And that's a challenge I have professionally because I'm the, the voice or the contact person for our in the field school counselors and school psychologists and, and sort of the, the one that folks go to. And then my struggle is I have nowhere else I need to go or I can ask for questions when something comes up. And so I'm supposed to be the all knowing sage on the mountain. And um, a lot of times that, as we all know, that <laughs> just doesn't work. And finding resources and supports when we're in that level of leadership of where do we turn for subsequent support and guidance ourselves or, or mentoring or cultivation of skills. I, I do tag my staff. If I have a, an individual client I need to consult about, um, for me, the consultation stuff is harder when it's about my personnel, <laughs> then I can't obviously talk to them. Um, but I have other counseling center directors I can call or consult with. Uh, but I think too, we can get in the habit of not reaching out for help. Like, uh, especially if you're, if the buck stops with you, uh, we just get in the habit of acting tough and, and not consulting. And then uh, sometimes I've made mistakes where I should have consulted more or taken my time and uh, it, it can be tough to know when to reach out when you get used to not reaching out. And probably oh, Catherine I and I'm, or uh, any of us in large uh, institutional or bureaucratic settings, it can be particularly challenging because at that moment you might be juggling a suicidal crisis, but you also are dealing with threat crises. I, and then there's a whole litany of other things. So you're simultaneously attending to scores of different competing priorities. And that's the other challenge is just trying to simultaneously process so many different things at any given particular moment. With that, that reaching out for consultation, as somebody who's, who's only a few years out of my training, um, it really was always great to see the um, See my supervisors and people also reaching out for consultations sometimes when they needed it like it was something that made it feel like oh this is something that is always okay to do and even when you've been here for a while that doesn't mean you have to have all the answers and can be something that i think um we can keep in mind of that not only by, by doing that are we getting the help that we need but we're also setting a good example for the people behind us and it doesn't look like it doesn't to me it never looks like a fault of like well sh they shouldn't they know this it looks more like hey they're rec it, it's okay to not always have that can't be hard to find that person but it was always really great to see them doing that and that's really beautifully said to try to create that culture of of outreach and, and mutual support so i think that's really a, a great piece of, of discussion there I think too, just the tone that that sets for, and the modeling it sets for our clients as well. You know, so many times they get to that suicidal crisis because they've been managing everything independently and reality is life does exceed our capacity to cope at times. So if they can look to us to, you know, to develop new ways of managing their stress, we step out of a session for five minutes, say, hey, I'm gonna just check in with a colleague I mean, we really do set a tone for them as well. And I, I appreciate all the discussion about the outreach efforts we can make among ourselves and to our established patients. Kind of making a list because we're at 1130 all right, right now. So I'm kind of making a list of um, things that we might be able to consider doing uh, as we go forward or, or where to go from here. And I'm wondering if there are outreach efforts that we as an organization should be making to some of our underserved groups. So, so we, we've got ideas now for folks that are in the profession or established with care, but how do we get folks in the door to begin with? Can 
I think for me, um, the university is like a little, a little cosmos. It's like a, a smaller version of Cleveland. And so, you know, I, I do outreach efforts with the LGBT center and the veterans, Af the veterans center and um, kind of focus our efforts on those areas uh, with folks where there might be more stigma around accessing mental health care and just, um, you know, so outreaching to those centers where they're already going, mm -hmm. um, instead of always trying to get them to come to us, you know, being a face and uh, providing a workshop or a training or um, sometimes in um, minority communities, the, the more informal events are, are the better ones to, to show up at and um, start to get to know people to help them access services. Um, so that's something I do at the university that I think, uh, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure out in the community how much outreach is going on to uh, like it, like the local LGBT center from, from mental health practices or agencies. I'm not sure how that works. Well, and as, as somebody who, who works in, in a, an integrated care setting, um, I could not agree more that trying to get out where people are is so important. And, you know, for example, we, we do the, the PHQ-9 as a screener um, in order to be able to, to catch kids who, who are having some of these things going on and hopefully be able to notice it early. And we're always working on building more efforts to be able to find people at that, those early stages of what's going on, as well as opening up that conversation so they can see these are okay things to talk about um, from a young age. Um, before with hopefully not allowing some of those other pieces to get ingrained in um, and really providing those services where they're at in a place that can help reduce the stigma um, can be such a, a beneficial thing within my my opinion. I think getting just getting our getting ourselves out there. Um, I've seen a lot of, of organizations even like the community mental health centers or the ADM boards, you know, connecting with suicide related activities in the community, having a table, having a presence, being available to provide information, education. Um, because people are, don't always, you know, jump on a website and look up, gee, what are the risk signs of suicide or, you know, um, yeah, I, Having a stigma busting, I know Stark had a stigma busting, you know, selfie station at the mall, you know, it's just, I don't know, just getting information out there, getting ourselves out there, I think is huge. Any other ideas on how to connect with folks um, and help with the destigmatizing and, and promoting access to care? I know NAMI also operates out of the hospital I work mm -hmm. out of too. So they get, when we have uh, family members in to have family meetings for, for patients, NAMI gets involved with the patients. We offer NAMI up to families try to hook, you know, connect them with things that are actually going on in their communities that don't necessarily involve, you know, us. But mm -hmm. I think it does kind of create a, a, a bridge to us because we're, we're offering them something that is a non-professional service, but it doesn't have to be all about us. So I think that does, that goes a long way with, with helping people to create those systems and those protective social circles outside of of their work with us. One of the little things that, that I've done in the past year is uh, volunteer at our church. Um, I taught a class on grief camp, and now I'm teaching Sunday school. And a large part of that is just helping these teenagers to know that it's okay to have feelings, mm -hmm. you know, something that <laughs> should be taught everywhere. But we've talked specifically about shame and how difficult that is and how it's okay to ask for help and how it's okay to feel angry and 
and hurt and have feelings and cry. I love that you're doing that out in a setting like that. That's so important um, to be, be getting that within the community as well as within our offices. I agree. And it goes back to what was brought up earlier about us as, as uh, you know, entire people in the room. Maybe it's helpful just to be a friendly face where they realize that we're just normal people and easy to talk to. And, and they could certainly seek out our services or, or somewhere down the road if they needed them. Yeah, I feel like half of doing integrated care and going in for warm handoffs is just trying to be like, look at me, I'm not scary. <laughs> like, yeah. I am not a terrifying person. You can come talk to me and it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. That is so true. Let me kind of go through some of the points that I've pulled out in terms of potential action plans and, and just kind of thinking about what's, what our next steps might be. Uh, so we had talked about maybe providing a forum for folks to access as existing resources. And Tracy, you compiled a very comprehensive list of those already. Uh, I wonder if that's a, a great starting point is just to let our other psychologists in OPA know what's already out there um, so that they're not alone, they're not starting from scratch. And even if they're feeling vulnerable or concerned that uh, this is something they could reach out to pretty easily. Um, other folks uh, have ideas about how we can just kind of connect people with existing resources. It's probably something we should make available. Well, and actually, Michael, tell me if I'm mistaken, but would a list like that be helpful for the ethics board just to have for their themselves or um, certainly, Howard, sounds like something would be useful for you to have. I'm just thinking about who reaches, where people reach out when they need something. I'm not sure necessarily the ethics committee, but, but okay. certainly Howard's committee uh, and whatever we can put on our website. I think if, you know, if it's easy for people to find, it might be helpful. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm on the ethics committee now and you know, so people approach the ethics committee when they have some kind of ethical dilemma, but what we're talking about is not really, in most of these cases, not an ethical dilemma, but just, mm -hmm. you know, I just need help struggling with what I'm feeling with, you know, that I'm feeling helpless and frustrated and powerless, and I don't know what my boundaries are. I mean, that's partly ethics, but it's partly just, I just need need a colleague to talk to, and mm -hmm. maybe that's, that's something the colleague assistance program slash uh, prevention and wellness committee could uh, could help people with mm -hmm. and could make ourselves available. Okay. And two, if you did periodic articles in our e-newsletter just to get it out there, um, might help destigmatize it a bit and at least get people thinking. Well, and I wonder, since Tracy, you already did so much work in preparing the document for today, would it be reasonable to condense some of that into an article for the e-newsletter, which I believe is due uh, next week? You're asking me to condense that into a... Oh, I'm just wondering. I'm not putting you on the spot in front of this entire audience, Tracy, but... You know how well I condensed, Cindy. <laughs> you did well, condense it down to eight. <laughs> <laughs> but that might be another avenue too, where we, you know, we're all kind of uh, uh, have all these fresh ideas. That might be the next next step then to invite the membership to be aware of what we're working on and, and what's already out there. All right. Next on the list I have is that um, Howard's going to work on some ideas for peer support for folks who are just struggling with caregiver burnout, with who've lost a patient to suicide. Uh, another point that came up earlier that I'd like to go back to is trainings to our some of our frontline staff in terms of safety because that is really important. Our nurses, uh, the folks who do the uh, you know phone intakes, what what can we do to kind of promote more continuity there or make them at least know that that it's okay to ask questions or or refer to us or what should we be offering to them? 
there are a number of different levels of training depending on people's role within organizations. This isn't, there's assist training, there's, there's the QPR, there's AMPS, or there's all kinds of different trainings. So I think depending on, maybe nice to have people aware of the different levels of trainings that they could kind of offer up the, or at least make other people aware of in their organizations or bring into their organizations. A lot of this stuff is free too, by the way. Oh, great. That's always a bonus. And we some have a list here for office managers that we could post some information on. Okay. And that's a terrific idea. And I know uh, going back to us as kind of tools, um, I, one thing that I value very much is I try to make myself approachable to my other, you know, everybody else that works with the patients. And so it means a lot to me when my nurses are doing, uh, you know, vitals on a patient and they'll send me a quick, quick Skype message that, you know, that's out here crying or uh, he smells like marijuana or whatever it is that they want to make sure I know about. I, that I welcome that and I always make a point of letting them know how much I appreciate that they took the time to, to do that, especially in telemedicine. I can't see my patients walk, so I might miss a lot of um, pain that they're in. And, and so I appreciate the nurse taking the time to let me know about that. That's another thing that we can offer is just letting them know if you're worried about a patient and it's beyond what, what you should or could be managing, so let us know. Um, and again, some of these we've just already revisited. Uh, doing more community outreach to where people are. I think that's just such a great idea and one that seems so simple, but if we can't get our own professionals to take five minutes for self-care, you know, what might we do to encourage folks to do more outreach? I think one of the things would be to uh, make more visible the kinds of efforts that are already underway and the examples uh, that people could follow. I love that. With um, the 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 voice of someone with lived experience has been a big push in the zero suicide um, initiative. And that may be someone who has lost somebody that may be an attempt survivor. Um, I, and I think we've talked a lot today just about role modeling different things um, for each other and for uh, the people that we work with. So I don't know, including the peer support stuff. So I don't know how, it all rolls in, but it seems that there is kind of a theme there that we could capitalize on. I know I, I am all about, you know, <clears throat> I'm all about doing whatever I can to, to help out with this suicide effort, whether it's supporting my coworkers or colleagues or, you know, talking about my experience or sharing information that I have, whatever's necessary, I'm willing to do it, so. Appreciate that, Tracy. What are some of the other um, steps forward that that folks are considering for themselves or, or think that we should look to as an organization based on today's discussion? I do think that, that we should, on a yearly basis, provide some kind of training around suicidality at the convention. I think that's a great idea, just to allow folks to self-select in or out if that's a topical area of interest. and. Um, Part of the struggle is having content experts like you, Tracy, uh, mm -hmm. and others being willing to lend their expertise to the convention, or else uh, even consider offering some standalone workshops, which is something that uh, mm -hmm. we're trying to actively promote. And those are incredibly easy to set up with uh, the education committee making a proposal for a half day or full day. Um, and then Karen Harden in our office just does a magnificent job organizing the logistics to the degree that you 
really just show up, um, give your content, and uh, you know, decide if you want to do that for free uh, or if you want to return that money back to OPA even. So um, it's really just a wonderful experience to do. And so I think if we can encourage our colleagues who have content matter expertise uh, to contribute, whether mm -hmm. it's the standalone workshop or the, the convention. I'd also add to that with some online uh, self-study uh, activities that people could also participate in and getting kind of information you've been talking about and ideas about how they can approach this, uh, models that they can find out about, resources that they can get more information from. And there are a lot of those around suicide as well. Free online trainings. And Some then of maybe them are included in the eight page dissertation. <clears throat> and I wonder if we could also look at maybe our, our as we think about the context of our strategic plan too, how can we partner with other behavioral mental health groups um, and other systems that we touch, whether it's um, reaching across the aisle to ASPA uh, for the school sites, or if it's going to the Ohio Counseling Association, Ohio NASW uh, would be some of the primary actors that immediately come to mind and how can we collaborate? I would also just add on to that too, Eric. I think about the Ohio um, Suicide Prevention Foundation that's right there in Columbus and Austin Lucas has been just fabulous in terms of providing me with resources and they're the, they're the ones with all the money for all the trainings, so uh, that may be a great way for many of our colleagues to get trained without a huge cost to them. That's really great feedback, Tracy, uh, because I think part of it is who would be some of the cardinal suicide mm -hmm. actors that we would want to affiliate or make connectivity to, and so uh, Maybe Michael, and as you're looking for more groups to have connectivity to in your leadership role as CEO, that might be some of that outreach as well. They participate in a couple of the coalitions we're involved with. Great. We could invite them to exhibit at the convention. That might be okay. one way to uh, Absolutely. connect our members to them. That's a great idea. I, it, For some reason, I thought about um, there's a small item in our strategic plan around first responders, collaborating more with first responders and uh, police, uh, particularly I think are at slightly higher risk for suicide, um, probably because of all the trauma they see and the easy access to firearm there. Um, so I don't know if that's something that that uh, group would be interested in uh, thinking about, you know, how they've worked with first responders around suicide risk uh, or working with uh, police, for instance, who've lost a, a colleague to suicide. Uh, it might be really interesting just to hear a little bit more about or read an article about that. Well, and both from, from that angle, as well as from working with people, um, responding to calls where it turns out what is happening is the person is experiencing suicidal ideation or things like that. Because um, I know a lot of people are not aware of the crisis team, so the police are who they call um, if they're worried about a family member. Hmm. Yeah, I, I've um, worked with our police a little bit um, on campus. They respond a lot of times to the residence halls when a student is at risk for suicide. And they tend to hospitalize pretty quickly. Um, or I should say they transport to the hospital <laughs> and then the students released uh, pretty frequently. And so I was trying to get them to do a little more fine tuned uh, risk assessment and safety planning. But I tell you what, the, the disciplinary culture uh, differences are vast, you know. So if I couldn't give them something on a, on a little card that they could carry with them uh, and do the same way each time, like it was going to be hard for them to really adapt to that individual student. Um, it's just a really different skill set uh, that we have versus what they're going in to do. Um, feels like a little more blunt object, uh, you know, even though our police are really nice and community policing and uh, they do a really good job. It's, it's hard to get that fine tuned assessment at, at their level of work, what they're being asked to do. So that's been a little challenging. I'm not sure how folks. Do you have uh, CIT trained officers there? 
Um, I think they are CIT trained, uh, but I, I haven't been to a CIT training, so I don't know what that it consists of. All well, I my, see is the result. <laughs> my understanding is that CIT officers are self-selected to do that work, at, at least in, in the communities that I've, I've yeah. worked in. And they get training from people like us who may come in and talk about personality disorders or DBT or coping skills or suicidality. And because mm -hmm. um, I, I think just having an awareness that those people are around yeah. and even for people who are struggling, they know to call and ask for a CIT officer instead of just Joe average cop you get a very different response. And that that's so important. Sense. In fact, it's something we promote statewide with our school resource officers to make sure that they uh, have access to CIT. Um, but also, Catherine, you know, I've just been a blunt object myself and gotten into the uh, SRO, the school resource officer meetings, and just used that as an opportunity to uh, do some training on suicidality, as I've learned with law enforcement. Um, they have a very limited uh, window of trying to get something done. And so yeah. um, they want to move very quickly. If a person is in crisis, if they can triage that one direction or the other, then they need to move on. And so um, yeah. where we sometimes in our clinical work have more uh, flexibility to have more protracted involvement, we have to appreciate that they really want to dispatch this. This is just one of a multitude of other things that they need to fix and move on and, and go on with their day so to speak yeah yeah but we could provide them with you know those aces cards where they have all of the columbia questions to ask to screen someone for suicide risk. absolutely that's a good idea in fact good. we've been moving in the schools to using the columbia scales across the board um, and um, for those that have some clinical background using the columbia scales with the safety as well um, so that they can kind of build upon that. And that's been really well received statewide um, as a much easier approach to assess suicidality. That's I just want to just point out the time real quick. We've got 10 minutes left. Um, so I want to go ahead and take any final comments and then I'll leave a minute or two to process just sort of the experience of, of how this went this morning. So any other uh, point, points that we need to consider in terms of how to move forward, other things you want to make sure I've included in the minutes. I think, Cindy, just on behalf of, of each of us as elected officers, really want to thank uh, our participants today, mm -hmm. and particularly you, Tracy, for lending your expertise to this discussion, mm -hmm. uh, and for each of our participants to help give us some language and some other ideas to look at with respect to where we can uh, continue to move as an association and supporting our membership and, and the larger broad stroke of psychology in Ohio. So uh, we are deeply indebted to you, Tracy, as well as to each who have so graciously given their morning on this uh, Saturday uh, to talk about a, a challenging topic. And, um, mm -hmm. um, particularly when maybe this is some downtime for us when we want to maybe be thinking about other things like Ohio State football versus the clinical work that we need to do. Mm -hmm. I was waiting for your shout out there, Eric. <laughs> you know, I couldn't let it go. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree with Eric. And, and these points are just so poignant and so relevant. And I, I certainly learned a lot and benefited from being here and, and hearing everybody's contributions and I appreciate it. Yeah, I think it was a really good discussion and some great ideas came out that many things that we can do, so. Any feedback on just kind of the process, um, how it flowed today, how, how uh, the, the Zoom itself, uh, any other feedback just that we should consider for future assemblies? Including how do we engage more of our membership um, into the assembly process? Because again, the uh, participants here were able to just add a richness to this conversation and we want to continue to grow the success and the presence of these assemblies. Yeah, I think one of the things that would be helpful would be to give a better description of what the content is and what the purpose mm -hmm. is uh, so that people come a little better prepared and make judgments about can I make a contribution uh, to this mm -hmm. kind of discussion uh, because I, I felt I had minimal kind of understanding of of what the purpose was and what the outcome was likely to be. 
Okay. That's great. Yeah, that's helpful. I appreciated that there, that there was a balance of both talking about prevention strategies and providing information along with just giving us all an opportunity to just talk about what the experience is like of dealing with suicide. So I think that that's important in any assembly that we try to have that kind of balance. Okay. And obviously, I feel like all, all contributions and ideas were respected and um, really welcomed here. And I, I appreciate that everybody made this a, a, an environment where it's comfortable to share. All right. Is it is it on to you, Eric, for your? Yes, I, I, I well, I said if, uh, if need be, <laughs> I could use interpretive dance or lead us into OHIO. Um, and thankfully, I spared everyone from interpretive dance. So, um, come on, we got time, Eric. Let's uh, go. You're, you're right. <laughs> so, I think with that, then we have about uh, six minutes, and so we can uh, bring our assembly to a to a, I think, a positive and a successful conclusion. Uh, we will encapsulate the conversational content and share with all the participants as well as our membership. Uh, and thank everyone for, for offering time in their morning. Uh, is there anything else of the order before we uh, we wish you a good Saturday and happy footballing or hockey in your case? Hockey. I think if we could have kind of a summary article for the newsletter just so people get a sense, yeah. as Ken said, a better sense of what these um, virtual assemblies are like. Mm -hmm. um, that might help set the tone for better results in the future. Okay. In fact, almost theming it like what you missed today, kind of, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in a playful way, of course. Don't you wish right. you could be here? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Where all the cool kids were. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really school. love the discussion. I think uh, these fall assemblies are the richest discussions I have at OPA, and mm -hmm. uh, apart from maybe our some of our board retreats uh, where we get into it. Uh, so I really appreciate the time with you all. Uh, and hearing across different work settings and, and experiences it's been great. Yeah. Well, I think having said that, then we can uh, we can uh, virtually gavel this assembly to a conclusion. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Go Bucks. Bye. Go Bucks. Yes. <laughs>